Hello, everybody, and welcome to another lecture of Atma 412. I hope you're doing well. I hope you're staying healthy during this terrible pandemic. Um, I hope you're staying inside, as I've told you many times to do. As usual, please let me know if you need anything, if you've run out of pasta, if you've run out of toilet paper, kitchen towel, soap, uh, face masks. Uh, if you need anything, please uh, reach out anytime, and I'll be more than happy to help you. So today's topic is a very interesting one, and uh, actually it will be today's topic and also the topic for the next lecture. Uh, we will talk about uh, some weather phenomena that happen at smaller scales than the ones that we've examined so far. Uh, we've seen a lot of things regarding the synoptic scale, but what happens at the synoptic scale. So we've talked about QG, we've talked about uh, the PV framework, extratropical cyclones, uh, fronts, uh, winter storms, colder damming, etc. Today, uh, we want to talk about what happens at a smaller scale. Uh, in particular, uh, we want to talk about um, the mesoscale convective systems that uh, often happen in mid latitudes and that bring a lot of weather, a lot of severe weather sometimes. Um, to the mid-latitudes. So these are not main drivers of synoptic variability, but often they are driven by what happens at the synoptic scale. And the challenge for a meteorologist is to be able to correctly forecast the occurrence of these uh, convective systems well in advance, particularly as many of these are associated with severe weather, tornadoes, uh, hail, uh, flash flooding and whatnot. Numerical models are not are typically not the best to resolve these uh, systems, and so it can be challenging to forecast them um, with uh, significant advance. Uh, today, we want to start talking about these systems, and we do so by looking at the physics of these systems. Uh, and in particular, we will look at the very basic structures of these systems. Uh, what I mean by this is that today we will start by talking about uh, convection and in particular uh, what we call technically uh, deep convection or deep moist convection. Now um, deep moist convection is a bit of a mouthful but at the end of the day it only means a very simple thing, thunderstorms. So what makes a thunderstorm? Okay, this would be the question that uh, will concern us uh, for um, for today's talk, for today's uh, lecture. Um, so, thunderstorms uh, are very important, and they happen pretty much everywhere on the planet, apart from high latitudes. Um, they happen in the tropics. Uh, very frequently, particularly in the deep tropics uh, next to close to the equator. And in the mid-latitudes, they don't happen uh, all year round, but they can happen frequently during summer. They can happen when there is the right synoptic forcing. Maybe there is a cold front passing by. The cold front lifts uh, moist air uh, that was sitting on the ground, makes it go up, and it generates a big thunderstorm. Uh, or it could also be just some day with no particular synoptic variability, all of a sudden you build a lot of um, convective instability at the surface because you're heating the surface a lot, and this instability wants to be released. Um, and the release of this instability is the thunderstorm. Remember that convection, well, convection, the atmosphere and fluids in general don't like disparities. Uh, they're very democratic in, in this respect. And so when you generate an instability in a particular region of the fluid, the fluid would always act to uh, remove the instability. And the removal of the instability is convection, and in this case, um, a thunderstorm. Uh, incidentally, the thunderstorms that happen with no synoptic variability are probably some of the hardest to forecast exactly. In case there is a synoptic, uh, some kind of a synoptic forcing, then we do have a lot of tools to address um, what may happen. 
we have the QG framework, uh, we, you know, we have geostrophic winds, we know how to diagnose the ageostrophic components in atmospheric fronts. So we kind of know what may happen if there is a large enough synoptic system that may pass by. On the other hand, if you have a thunderstorm that just is created out of nowhere, then it's a lot harder to forecast in advance. Part of the reasons why it's a lot harder also has to do with the fact that thunderstorms, unlike um, extratropical cyclones, unlike the things that we talked about until now, happen typically on relatively small scales, small scales. Um, synoptic scale, we said, was of the order of 1,000 kilometer. If you have organized thunderstorms, these typically happen on the mesoscale, which is of the order of 100 kilometers, more or less. A single thunderstorm, if not organized, just one single thunderstorm, how big can it be? Uh, well, I would say of the order of 10 kilometers, maybe. And this means that if you are forecasting a, an extratropical cyclone, or even a tropical cyclone maybe, well, let's just say an extratropical cyclone for now, uh, and you make a mistake of 10 kilometers in forecasting it. So you have something that is 1,000 kilometer long. If you make a mistake uh, in predicting its position by 10 kilometers, well, that's 10 kilometers over 1,000, uh, so it's an error of 1%. So it's no big deal. However, if you have a thunderstorm that is on the scale of 10 kilometers and you make a mistake in predicting it uh, of the order of 10 kilometers, well, then you have a mistake of 100%. Um, you know, uh, 10 kilometers, let, you know, forget about the... Um, the mid latitudes for a moment. Let's think about Hawaii uh, for whatever reason. Let's say that um, the um, trade wind inversion is lifted uh, and a thunderstorm happens. If you guys were on the island last uh, June, that would be June 2019. I think it was June. Uh, anyway, the night that there was the thunderstorm, which we all remember because we all woke up at 3 a.m. in the morning excited that, you know, we could hear thunder. Um, and stuff. Um, well, 10 kilometers on Oahu is the difference between Honolulu and Kailua. You know, it's the difference between the windward side and the leeward side. It's the difference between having a massive downpour in uh, on Honolulu and having it over the ocean. Um, and so it makes a huge difference. Um, and this is what makes thunderstorms particularly hard to uh, forecast with uh, with precision. Also, imagine the scenario where you have a thunderstorm happening over um, somewhere in the mountains. Um, these are equally challenging because, once again, because of the orography, an error of even a few kilometers may mean that a valley could be completely flooded or a valley would be uh, left practically untouched by the thunderstorm. So these are, at the same time, equally important to forecast in advance, but also extremely difficult. And so convection is really important. Even though we've thought about the synoptic scale until, until now, I really want to strike this message home uh, for you guys that um, that there are many scales that a forecasters need to consider. Um, synoptic scale, global and synoptic scale, definitely you know among the first that you should think about. But at the end of the day, you also have to look at local conditions. Okay, we will talk about uh, organized convection, so mesoscale convective systems, in the next lecture. Uh, today, I'd like to introduce just the basic ingredients uh, for a thunderstorm. What makes a thunderstorm? Uh, and how is it different from a regular cloud? What should you expect um, for a thunderstorm? Okay, we begin by watching this uh, really cute GIF. This is uh, a GIF of a, uh, a time, uh, time lapse uh, over an island. 
I apologize, I'm forgetting the name of the island. This is uh, an island in the Caribbean um, by, uh, well, close to Cuba uh, and Puerto Rico. Um, and you can see at the beginning of the GIF, you can see that convection is starting to kind of, uh, you know, kicks in almost like it, it, it's almost like it's boiling. Okay. And it makes a lot of small puffy cumulus clouds. And then at some point when the conditions are ripe, boom, it creates uh, a massive cloud that we call cumulonimbus cloud. Um, and that typically removes the uh, instability. Usually we are used to watching um, cumulonimbus clouds at usual, you know, with, with, you know, the usual speed of time. I don't know, for lack of better words, you know, a second per second. And so we don't quite grasp the magnitude of, uh, of, well, not the magnitude, but like we don't fully grasp um, how much this deep convective event almost looks like an explosion. Look at this GIF. There are all these clouds and the atmosphere is itching to rid of the instability. And so when it can find the right conditions, then kaboom, it creates um, this big this big cloud. Also, after the big cloud, look at the surface. It's like there is a shock wave that propagates out, right? Look at it. Now it explodes now. And there's like a shock wave at the surface. So this GIF kind of illustrates the main components of um, of a thunderstorm. The first one is the updraft. The second one is the downdraft. And the third one, sometimes it's called outflow, sometimes it's called cold pool. Okay, Let's start with the main one, which is the one that we're all familiar with and that we, uh, we all think about. Um, and we all think about when we think of a storm. The updraft is essentially a current of air that goes up, okay? Um, as the air uh, rises above the boundary layer, the uh, water vapor that is contained in the air condenses eventually. Um, the condensation um, produces uh, the cloud. And if... Um, if uh, the conditions are uh, are good, then this parcel of air that's condensed can keep going um, until great altitudes, and it forms these really, really tall clouds. The primary dynamical source uh, for the updraft is buoyancy, the way that we think uh, about thermal, good old Archimedean buoyancy, if you will. And what is interesting is that the buoyancy can be driven by two things, essentially. The first thing is uh, that it could be driven by temperature excess, meaning you have a parcel of air at the surface that is uh, warmer than the rest of the environment, and so the parcel can go up. Near the tropics, well, in the tropics, things are a little bit more complicated, and um, it seems that Temperature gradients, horizontal temperature gradients, are kind of small. And uh, there is one thing that we call, this condition we call weak temperature gradient approximation. And so if temperature gradients are small, then it's probably someone else who plays a big role in generating thunderstorms. Well, that someone else is water vapor. I don't know if you've ever thought about this, but water is actually lighter than dry air, okay? Just think about it. Air is heavier than water. The reason why your intuition suggests otherwise is that water and air have very different um, vapor points. Uh, we can call it like that, or boiling points. So air at room temperature is mostly in gas form, but, uh, and water is in solid form, in liquid, uh, sorry, solid form, geez. I don't know, that would be a really cold room if water was in a solid form. So maybe in Antarctica, that would be a correct statement, but definitely not, 
mid latitudes and tropics. Anyway, uh, it's in liquid form. And um, however, some of the water molecules have enough energy and speed to free themselves from the container where they are. And, um, and so the air always contains some kind of water vapor. Water vapor actually contributes to giving positive buoyancy to the air. And so sometimes even a patch of humidity is enough for generating a thunderstorm. So keep that in mind. Um, it's interesting that, however, buoyancy is not the only player uh, in the game because there are other forces. So if you look at the equations, uh, the equation of motion on the slide, uh, there is buoyancy, uh, but there are also pressure terms. And the pressure terms, there are some pressure terms that are related to um, more mechanical forcing and some pressure terms that are related to the buoyancy forcing. And these uh, pressure terms, these buoyancy-related pressure terms, um, can be thought of almost as a drag that the parcel experiences. So the parcel is going up in the atmosphere, but as it's going up, because it occupies a physical volume, uh, the parcel, um, well, essentially experiences uh, just good old drag, okay? Just because it has to push air of the, from the environment out of the way uh, to, um, to keep ascending. Uh, very good. So, um, one important phenomenon that happens, uh, to, um, to the updraft as it ascends is that it experiences a phenomenon that we call entrainment. So as the air goes up, this parcel of air goes up, it mixes with the environment. Okay. Uh, mixing means that a little bit of the cloudy air is kind of shedded uh, away, you know, a bit like some hair are shedded when you like comb your hair every day. Um, I hope that doesn't happen just to me because otherwise I would worry. Um, but some air from the environment is kind of ingested into the cloud, okay? And so sometimes updrafts actually increase in volume in going up. Okay, and this is a very important process. The ingesting of the air is called entrainment. It's a very important process and arguably one of the hardest to understand and represent in climate models. The opposite, the shedding, like, um, uh, like when you're combing your hair and you think you're going bald, that is called detrainment. Okay, the details here are not important. Just be aware that this is one of the most uh, important topics uh, in in research right now. Um, entrainment is uh, sort of this view of entrainment is the process of entrainment is thought of in a very uh, is defined in a very simplistic kind of model. You know, you have this parcel of air that is going up. It eats some air from outside, and it just keeps going up. Now, this is a little bit um, how entrainment happens for real. It's still a matter of debate, if you will. Uh, well, first of all, the process of entrainment is not so simple. It's not a continuous process. Okay, it's not like just one dimensional continuous process, but it's something that happens, uh, you know, at a regular pace, different parts of the cloud laterally and train at different times, depending on how turbulent they are. And also, it's not like this air is ingested from outside, brought into the cloud and everything mixes uniformly. The air kind of goes in, but then it sort of hangs out. It mixes slowly. Uh, if you will. Also, entrainment could also happen from the top of the cloud. And so, entrainment and mixing are um, are conceptualized with very simple models, but the reality is a lot more complex than, um, than what the simple models might suggest. Okay. Uh, so, again, this just keep in mind that 
um, entrainment is still a very problematic uh, notion um, in um, in the study of convection, and particularly deep convection that is much more turbulent and uh, much harder to study that, than shallow convection. Uh, rule of thumb, shallow convection means that, as the name suggests, clouds are relatively shallow uh, and do not reach enough of a depth in the atmosphere to condense enough um, water to precipitate. So the clouds that we often see here in Hawaii, they are shallow clouds, okay, shallow cumulus clouds. Uh, they do sometimes precipitate because of orographic forcing, because they're pushed against the mountain. Um, but often these clouds can exist over the ocean, no problem, they don't precipitate out. Cumulonimbus clouds, they don't reach up to, you know, 200 kilometers, uh, 200 kilometers, that would be a big cloud. They don't, the cu shallow cumulus clouds, they don't reach uh, more than two, two and a half kilometers in feet. That is um, seven, eight thousand feet. Um, okay, but cumulonimbus clouds they often reach until the very top of the troposphere. They go all the way to the tropopause, which in the tropics could be fifteen kilometers easier. Um, easy, uh, fifteen kilometers in feet is. 42,000 feet, 43,000 feet, so that is a lot. Fun fact, um, when, um, I don't know if we'll get to talk about this, but when you have a warm anomaly at the surface, cloud starts to go up and it condenses. Let's assume that you had enough of uh, forcing to just keep going up. What happens in uh, most cases, uh, particularly when you have thunderstorms that are not synoptically driven, just, you know, your garden variety summer storm uh, with no winds doing anything funky, okay? Well, what happens is that as the air goes up, it condenses. But as the air goes up, it cools down, right? And so it loses buoyancy pretty quickly. The atmosphere is set to be in a state of uh, stability with respect to dry convection. So as the air goes up, it cools down a lot faster than the environment, and it kind of gains negative buoyancy pretty quickly. However, certain parcels may be lucky enough that they get to a height where they start condensing enough water vapor that the water vapor releases laden heat well, releases a significant amount of latent heat. This amount of latent heat heats up the cloud a little bit, and this heating gives a little bit more of a positive buoyancy, you know, brings the buoyancy back up. And so it allows the parcel to go a little bit um, uh, forward, you know, in its ascent. So more water vapor is condensed, so more latent heat is released, and you kind of see where I'm going with this. So certain parcels are lucky enough to condense enough water vapor to then sustain their growth until the very top of the tropopause, or the troposphere in the tropopause. And that is both why in the GIF that I showed at the beginning, the thunderstorm didn't quite explode right away. It took a little bit of time, okay? Uh, because most parcels go up, they don't get to the point where they condense enough water vapor. They kind of stop and they go down again, and they just keep going in this overturning circulation. But when the conditions are right, then it really is like an explosion, because all of a sudden, it's like a positive feedback almost. The higher you go, the more you condense, the more you release latent heat, the higher you go, right? Because the more buoyancy you gain. And so thunderstorms are not trivial to achieve 
And what really makes a thunderstorm a thunderstorm is not so much the instability of the surface, or, well, that's part of it, but not just the instability of the surface. It needs to have this constant effect by the latent heat, and that will get your cloud to become one of those big, majestic clouds. So we say that the atmosphere, in these conditions, we say that the atmosphere is um, conditionally unstable. So it's stable to, uh, well, we say that the atmosphere is in a state of conditional instability. So it is stable to dry convection, right? So you go up, but negative buoyancy pretty quickly, but it's unstable to moist convection. So provided that you get to condense enough water vapor, then boom. The point where you start condensing, that is called the lifting condensation level, cloud base. You know, friends call it the cloud base, but it's lifting condensation level, LCL. Um, but the point where you actually start to gain positive buoyancy again, that is called the level of free convection. And typically for parcels, it's higher than the lifting condensation level. And that explains why most clouds that you see uh, on the mainland during summer, they become shallow, puffy clouds, but not all of them, actually most of them, never become like a gigantic cumulonimbus cloud. So keep this in mind. Next time you see a thunderstorm, um, I want to say be appreciative of latent heat uh, or not. If you didn't bring an umbrella, I don't know. But it's quite not trivial that this happens. Um, also, um, just to fix terminology, the layer of the atmosphere where a parcel experiences negative buoyancy between the lifting condensation level and the level of free convection, that is called a convective inhibition layer. And the uh, sort of the strength of this layer is uh, has the name of con convective inhibition and it's called SIN, C-I-N. So that's why when you see skew T log P uh, maps, uh, you often look at the CAPE, which is convective available potential energy that we talked about at the very beginning on the class. Uh, but you also look at SIN because you could have a lot of CAPE, so potentially you could generate a big thunderstorm, but maybe the convective inhibition is also equally high. And so clouds go up, they really encounter a wall. And the release of latent heat may not be enough to overcome this inhibition layer. This was mostly to fix terminology and also to clarify a fundamental aspect of thunderstorm dynamics, that it's not just what happens at the surface. Uh, so don't just think about CAPE. CAPE doesn't tell the whole story. It's also what happens after you start uh, condensing, essentially. Um, okay. So let's go back to uh, the updrafts. How strong was the updraft? Is an updraft? Well, it kind of varies, really. Um, it varies on uh, many different parameters, if you will. Um, there is um, updrafts on the mid latitudes tend to be typically uh, a lot stronger than updrafts in the tropics uh, for many reasons, uh, some of which are still not completely clear. Um, the fact that in the tropics, I'm thinking deep tropics, so equator like um, you know, Malaysia, Sumatra, kind of this, this area of the world, uh, Western Pacific, uh, more than Hawaii, which is, you know, highly capped. So as ascending branch of the ITCZ kind of region. There, you don't have a whole lot of inhibition. And so, you know, parcels just go up and they just keep doing their thing. And, you know, the environment is pretty moist. And so Cape never really gets to be super high in the tropics. But in the mid-latitudes, you have a combination of two things. Cape, that can be really, really high. You know, in Oklahoma, in summertime, Cape can go all the way up to 5,000 joules per kilogram, whereas in the tropics, it's, you know, 1,000 joules per kilogram or something like that. 
And also the inhibition is really, really high. So it's a little bit like you take a spring and you compress it a lot. And the sin is kind of how much you compress it. When you let it go, boom, right? And so uh, the figure on the slide, uh, let's focus on the right side of the figure. And so let's just look at the app draft. Uh, this is uh, app draft speeds uh, for different um, field campaigns uh, that measured uh, app draft speeds. Um, Gate is a very famous uh, campaign that happened over the Atlantic Ocean, the Atlantic, the tropical Atlantic Ocean. Uh, very, very famous. Uh, the ones to the left, so three meters per second, is uh, most of these are tropical. Um, uh, tropical thunderstorms. The ones to the right where it says thunderstorm project, which sounds very ominous. Uh, these are more representative of uh, continental mid-latitude thunderstorms. The thunderstorm project was one of the first project, really, uh, um, observational campaigns to study thunderstorms ever in the history of mankind. You know, people had speculated about convection and thunderstorms for centuries, but nobody ever bothered to fly through a storm. Well, mostly because there were no airplanes, I suppose, but, um, you know, do detailed quantitative observations. Um, and the thunderstorm project, which happened, um, I want to say, towards the end of the 40s, was really the first effort to try and understand thunderstorms from a scientific point of view. Uh, if you remember, we had talked about the invention of uh, numerical weather predictions, you know, von Neumann and these people. So uh, after the war, there was this acknowledgement that the weather was important, and it was important to forecast the weather for agriculture, for the military, for a bajillion applications. And so that's when people really started to pay attention to thunderstorms. Um, uh, this is another, uh, this is another, uh, visualization of pretty much the same information. Uh, Y axis is, uh, height above the ground. X axis is the intensity at six kilometers for this, for this thunderstorm at six kilometers, you have a uh, vertical velocity of 20 meters per second. 20 meters per second is, uh, what? 72 kilometers an hour, which is, I don't know, 40 miles an hour. Yeah, I don't know, 40, 45 miles an hour, which is a lot. Um, you would not want to fly through an app draft that looks like that, uh, probably. There are, it's not the worst that you could find, like... Um, there are supercell storms where vertical velocities can go all the way up to 50 meters per second, which is closer to, um, uh, to I don't know, 90 miles per hour, 88 miles per hour, uh, and send you back in time. Um, so it's, it's actually a pretty substantial velocity. And... Um, one reason why the maximum of velocities is higher up in the clouds is that above four and five kilometers, that's when the ice phase kicks in. And so you had release of latent heat of condensation at cloud, well, yeah, at cloud base, but then you have an additional release of latent heat, which isn't a lot because the latent, latent heat of fusion is almost a tenth of the latent heat of vaporization, but it gives you an extra kick as you're going up uh, to go even, even higher up. Now, one interesting thing is that if you actually look at, um, uh, if you look at the app drafts, even though most plots that you'll see, like the ones we just saw, they show you know a, a profile of vertical velocity with height, and it kind of gives you this idea that, you know, it's like this beautiful profile. If you were to look at a slice of the cloud, so not just a profile that gives you 
vertical velocity at a specific point, but like fly actually through the storm, you'd find an incredible amount of variability, which is the reason why when you're unlucky enough to catch a flight in the middle of summer um, and there's a thunderstorm and for whatever reason the pilot decides to fly th through the thunderstorm, it's not like a steady moment where you enter the thunderstorm, you know, you're lifted up, you keep going, and then as you leave, you kind of sink back down where you were before, right? It's extremely turbulent. I've definitely been through thunderstorms where, you know, you're like shaken, um, not steered, like uh, like uh, James Bond's is, um, drinks. But, you know, it's like this constant shaking. And the shaking ha happens because... Uh, in one point, there's a vertical velocity of 10 meters per second, let's say, and that kicks the airplanes up. Uh, the next point, there's zero meter per second, or maybe even a descending current. And so the airplane is pushed down. And so it's this constant up and down and up and down. And this contributes to making um, thunderstorms particularly dangerous to fly uh, through because this differential, this generates a differential uh, force on the fuselage of um, of the airplane and this could cause you know fractures or or whatever um, okay uh, so this was from another uh, measurement and you can see altitude if you look at the figure Altitude in the y-axis, uh, time in the x-axis. So imagine the airplane is like flying through this uh, thunderstorm and it's like measuring at all heights in the thunderstorm. The white uh, and the contours are for positive velocity and the black, well, the black, uh, the shading is, um, the gray is for negative velocities. So, yeah, first observation, look at how quickly velocity changes. You know, at like 1503 at 10 kilometers, you have 24 meter per second. Half a minute later, you have half of the velocity. And two minutes later, you're outside of the cloud, even though that seems to be more, I don't know if that... That vertical line is very vertical. I don't know if maybe the instrument was malfunctioning, but point being, there's a lot of variability inside of the thunderstorm, which also should make you think about how good the approximation that went into our conceptual picture of entrainment really is, if, you know, it's it's so heterogeneous. Um, okay, the other thing I wanted to bring your attention to on this figure is what happens below six kilometers, well, six and a half kilometers, look at how everything is gray. So I'm sure you all imagine that probably there are ascending currents in the thunderstorm and there are descending currents in the thunderstorm because, you know, um, what goes around comes around in a way. Um, but just look at how widespread and like how segregated the upward motion and the downward motion is. This is one distinctive feature that separates shallow convection from deep, convec deep convection. In shallow convection, you have an updraft that goes out and kind of dies off, right? There is descending motion, but it's mostly confined to a thin shell around the cloud, okay? Um, um, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to remember the specific uh, name. Um, a subsiding shell. There you go. I was all proud that I said the word fuselage, but I couldn't come up with subsiding. So I apologize. Um, I mean, being confined at home, I don't speak English. I don't speak at all. And when I talk to my family, we don't speak English. So I don't. I apologize if my English is getting worse and worse and worse. I'm sorry. I'm definitely out of practice. Deep convection, on the other hand, <clears throat> has really strong downdrafts, really strong 
downward currents that complicates, that makes things a lot more beautiful, in my opinion, but complicates things from a conceptual point of view. So let's talk about those descending motions. Downdrafts can be, uh, it's a tough word to pronounce for me, downdrafts, downdrafts. Anyway, downdrafts can reach the surface, uh, that can reach the surface are, you know, one of the key distinctive features of deep convection, okay? Um, what is the difference between shallow convection and deep convection? Well, as you, I mean, as you probably imagine, the only thing that separates the two is the fact that one is raining, the other one isn't. Um, the raindrops that fall, uh, just think a bit, just think about this from a microscopic level. Think of a little raindrop that is falling down. The raindrop is falling down, but it doesn't just flow through the atmosphere with no problem, right? There is some interaction, right? And there is some friction on the sides of, of this, of this raindrop, right? Air sort of flows around the raindrop, but the raindrop kind of pulls a little bit of this air down in a turbulent wake, okay? So one raindrop pulls down a few molecules of water. Now imagine billions of raindrops, right? Billions of raindrops, they bring down a lot of air, okay? So the air starts falling. As the air is going down, what happens? Well, at some point, sooner or later, the air may find itself outside of the cloud, okay? So we're in a region now where there is no saturation anymore. The air is not saturated. You have liquid water falling through unsaturated air. As you may have guessed, what these cr this creates is evaporation. Some of the molecules from the raindrop say, hey, I want to leave now, given that now we have so much space. When you're inside of a cloud, you're kind of confined and you're nowhere to go because outside it's saturated, so it's full, right? It's like going to a hotel that is fully booked, right? You know, imagine, okay, let, let's use this metaphor. It's like camping outside a hotel that is fully booked. Camping can be uncomfortable, but you got nowhere to go. You know, even if you're, imagine there's like 50 of you in a small tent, but you have nowhere to go. Uh, on the other hand, if suddenly you hear that um, now some of the rooms are empty, some guests have left because, I don't know, food poisoning or they didn't like the place, whatever. Uh, now you have the option of leaving the tent with 50 people and go uh, in the hotel. So that is kind of the idea when a raindrop finds itself into an unsaturated or subsaturated environment like uh, the ones outside the cloud. So um, the evaporation obviously doesn't come for free, okay? Um, because water molecules are, uh, you know, they bond inside of, uh, pretty strongly inside of, of a liquid droplet. And if a droplet is to leave, uh, sorry, if a water molecule is to leave the droplet, someone has to pay the energy that it costs to break um, to break that bond, okay? Well, this energy is paid by the air around it, and it pays it by uh, giving up some temperature, okay? So evaporation cools down um, the air around the, um, the raindrop, okay? Um, so you have these billion raindrops that are falling down. They take some of the air with them. The evaporation is cooling constantly that air, the cooling creates negative buoyancy. And so you initiate with condensate loading, as it's called, like raindrops pulling, but then um, the evaporation is providing you the fuel to keep going down. And this is what creates downdrafts and maintains downdrafts that can go all the way down uh, to the surface. Now, much like updrafts, 
uh, had a different uh, different magnitudes, and continental updrafts could be really strong, and tropical downdrafts not so much. The same applies to downdrafts, and you can have really strong downdrafts in um, in the mid latitudes, not so strong downdrafts um, uh, in the tropics. Although, you know, um, I'll be careful even in the tropics if I were you. Uh, one more thing that happens, and we'll see this in the next in the next lecture. Uh, one thing that may happen is that convection may not actually just happen isolated, like you know, a single cloud goes up, boom, it rains, and that's it. Convection may organize, meaning that different clouds that are close together may start to work uh, in. Oh, excuse me. Um, that was the winds that uh, shot one of the doors out upstairs um i hope it was that and not like poltergeist but well we'll see um so clouds start to work in cooperation um and this may actually help downdrafts uh descend from even greater altitudes than the mid troposphere you know from 10 kilometers or even high we'll see that uh we'll see that in the next lecture so where does the downdraft come from? I kind of hinted the mid troposphere. Well, downdraft air can originate in two different uh, places. It can originate um, either in the mid troposphere or it can actually originate, believe it or not, at the surface. Okay, so in the first case, what happens is that there's this downdraft, you know, suddenly this precip. It's going down, and as it goes down, it entrains air laterally from whatever altitude the downdraft is at, okay? And so this is like mid-level air that is like brought down and sinks all the way down to the surface. The air at the surface clearly it cannot fall, you know, any further than the surface. But what may happen is that the air is sitting at the surface, living its peaceful, quiet life, the air starts going up in a cloud, in an updraft, okay? It goes up. But as it's going up, let's assume there is some other air on top of it. The air on top of it starts to rain, okay? And so the rain is now raining inside of your parcel that had just left the surface. It's raining into that parcel. Condensation, condensate loading, rain evaporation, it, creates it turns the buoyancy of that parcel from positive to negative and so your parcel will do like this and then boom down again so you have mid-level um downdrafts or up down um downdrafts how much of each you get kind of depends on the conditions um you know where you are and you know thunderstorm by thunderstorm in general this is not a very well understood question part of the Part of the reasons for this is that it's hard to observe um, and understand downdrafts. Some of these, much like updrafts, are really dangerous to fly through. Uh, some people observe downdrafts at the surface, and they do so by using variables that are conserved. Uh, now, let's take a step back. When we consider shallow convection, Many variables in shallow convection are conserved. Uh, total water of an air parcel is conserved because you know you're going up. Some water vapor will condense, but it's not like the, con the, the condensate is going anywhere. You know the cloud is still there, and so you're just transformed one water vapor into cloud droplets, but the total amount of water is still the same. Potential temperature, which is constant, which is yeah constant under adiabatic processes. Uh, that will also remain um, unchanged. Um, in deep convection, things are a little bit more complicated because now you're going up, you're condensing, but rain is falling out, and so you're losing a lot of stuff. And so in deep convection, there aren't as many conserved variables as in shallow convection, which is what makes deep convection harder to study and to observe. One variable that comes um, in our help is moist static energy or equivalent potential temperature or wet bulb uh, 
potential temperature. These are kind of equivalent. And these are variables that are conserved under adiabatic processes, but also under water vapor, liquid water, uh, condensation processes. Okay, so in a downdraft, these are typically uh, conserved. The way that people use them is that when you have a downdraft and you're at the surface, you observe the, uh, let's say, the moistatic energy of the downdraft, and then you match it with the moistatic energy at different levels, at some level in uh, the troposphere. That level, because MSC is conserved, that level will be the same as the level where the downdraft is coming from. Okay, um, so this is um, so much uh, about the basic um, features of a downdraft. Downdrafts are particularly important because uh, because um, they constitute important hazards. Uh, they could constitute particular hazards for uh, population and for aviation. We said that um, rain evaporation is a particular, particularly important process in driving the downdraft all the way to the surface. Well, when you have a mid troposphere, lower troposphere that is particularly dry, you can expect to have uh, a lot of evaporation, which is going to give a lot of negative buoyancy to these downdrafts, and so it's going to give really high vertical velocity to the downdraft. This can create what is called microburst, okay? Microbursts are particularly important because if a plane is flying through a microburst, uh, these objects can cause the microburst, uh, I'm sorry, the airplane to lose its own buoyancy. And essentially it can like uh, crash the airplane. Um, some areas are more um, susceptible than others. Um, uh, microbursts or downbursts sometimes are called uh, are pretty rare in the tropics but in the mid-latitudes they could be a pretty common occurrence every time uh, you fly to um, Denver in Colorado for example that is an area that is quite prone to these phenomena uh, and so often you have to be really really careful when you're flying in because that could be a risk um, and these are, again, they're the kind of hard to predict uh, because they may happen on a scale of 20 minutes and, you know, your plane is getting closer to the runway. If you're a meteorologist uh, working for, if you're an aviation meteorologist, this would be something to be really, really aware of and concerned uh, about. Um, when these bursts uh, reach the surface, they can generate... Uh, all kinds of damage. They can generate straight light winds, uh, straight line winds, for example, uh, and damages to um, crops and properties. And we'll talk about this in a moment. Okay, enough about updrafts and downdrafts. Let me uh, drink. Now we talk about one of my favorite subjects of all time, which is the cold pool. So we're following this air, you know, that goes down in the downdraft. What happens to the air when it reaches the surface? Where, well, it doesn't just quite disappear. And if there is a continuous downdraft that goes on for like half an hour, uh, then the air has to go somewhere. And what happens is that the air typically expands out in an object that is known as a cold pool. Cold pool is cold pools are examples of so-called gravity currents, meaning uh, movements of air of fluid of a fluid uh, that are that is driven by differences in density with the environment. Um, if you've never seen um, a cold pool and it's hard to see because cold air looks just like warm air, um, avalanches are an example of. Um, gravity currents. There's a mixture of air and snow that is heavier, it's denser than the air around it, and it moves to try and ingest a lot of air to kind of equilibrate the density. Py pyroclastic flows 
are another example of a gravity current. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been to Italy, uh, but like if you've been to Pompeii, that uh, city that was submerged by the volcano, there's a lot of people in like weird shapes that are like being preserved. I mean, not like live people. Um, they made casts of um, dead people that they found when they found Pompeii. Um, and these people um, are in like terrible shapes that suggest that they're, you know, these people have died in, in a horrible, horrible way. But these people were not killed by the lava. Uh, Pompeii is actually pretty far from the volcano. They were killed by the pyroclastic flow that descended from the volcano. So we're talking air at several hundred degrees Fahrenheit. So these people were essentially cooked, kind of. Um, and, um, you know, they were preserved in ash and mud and whatever fell down. And that's how we have now all these weird um casts in in Pompeii uh but yeah pyroclastic flows are another example of um gravity currents haboobs are another example these phenomena happen um a lot in as you could imagine they happen near desert areas these are kind of dust storms and so um, unless you live in a city where people don't really clean their apartments and there's a lot of dust that accumulates, uh, you kind of need something like a desert to produce enough dust to make these things. Um, and so uh, the Arabic Peninsula is a, um, is a place where many of these happen. Um, the Sahara Desert also has its fair share of haboobs. Um, they also happen on the mainland, um, you know, Arizona, New Mexico, wherever you have a lot of sand, if you have cold air that is coming in, it's kind of the same idea. You know, this cold air is like advancing like an avalanche. Okay. In the context of a storm, um, you don't quite see it, right? Because it's not like it's lifting snow or or what have you, but um, but it is actually really important. Uh, the GIF that we're seeing here, this is a storm, I believe, over Manhattan. You see the downdraft uh, as it's advancing. You don't see the cold pool, but you see at some point these clouds, like in the middle of the boundary layer that are generated, these clouds are known as shelf clouds, and they're generated because the cold pool as it's propagating, lifts the air in the boundary layer. This air is lifted above its lifting condensation level, and it creates these kind of force clouds that don't live uh, very often. Actually, uh, fun fact, um, cold pools, I said you don't see cold pools, uh, but sometimes what could happen is that Cold pools happen in areas with a lot of insects. And so you could actually see on their radar, you could see the return of all the insects that are lifted uh, from the cold pool. True story. Um, so this is another you know, example of visualizations of cold pools. Uh, I think the Jeff to the right is probably the clearest example of what a cold pool looks like. Uh, you know, you have this thunderstorm and you have all this ring of colder air that is expanding out. I uh, also encourage you to check out this YouTube link um, that I cannot play right now for you. Okay, so um, this part of the thunderstorm is important for um, for a particular reason. And that, and that reason is that Cold pools are actually, can actually facilitate the organization of clouds into a thunderstorm. Um, we recognize three parts in a cold pool. We recognize the head, the wake, which is right behind the head, and we recognize the rest of the cold pool, which is slightly less interesting, if you ask me. So the head or gust front is characterized by a positive perturbation in pressure. Um, so it's like a hard wall that is propagating um, that is propagating out. And this is kind of a have to do with the fact that 
the head is constantly slowed down by um, by the environment that the air has to push out. If you were to write down the equations, this slowing down of the velocity, you know, du dx, will produce a dp dx. So it will produce a pressure gradient. And this pressure gradient is exactly what characterizes the head of the cold pool. Why is that important? Well, imagine a situation where you have a little bit of wind that is blowing against a cold pool. Okay, So the cold pool has positive pressure perturbation at, the, at its leading edge. You have wind that is blowing against it. And so the wind suddenly, let's say this is the head of the cold pool, suddenly hits a wall and sort of goes down, goes up, sorry, it's lifted up. If you remember at the, be at the beginning or a few slides ago, we said that air often encounters um, convective inhibition, right, that it has to overcome. So air, often air parcels need something to overcome this negative buoyancy barrier that they encounter. Well, the cold pool might just provide that. The air is going up, it loses buoyancy because it's going colder and colder. But as it's going up, it hits or it gets hit by the gust run of the cold pool, which provides enough mechanical acceleration to overcome the negative buoyancy um, inhibition layer and to then reach the level of free convection. Okay, so in this way, cold pools have a primary role in uh, triggering essentially. Uh, new convective cells. Um, cold pools, this is another wonderful visualization of, you know, this air that is descending down. Uh, cold pools propagate, as we said, essentially under its own density difference in a way. So the cold pool is really heavy and what it's trying to do Remember that fluids don't like inequalities. Inequalities. The cold, what the cold pool is trying to do is um, make its density the same as that of the environment. And the cold pool knows that if it expands out, then it ingests just by turbulence. It entrains some of the air from the gust front, and that will decrease its buoyancy and make it more and more like um, like the environment, okay? So the propagation speed goes, is proportional, is a function of the density difference. In particular, it goes like square root of the density difference, okay? Um, orders of magnitude, 10 meters per second is a good order of magnitude for propagation speed of cold pools. Um, okay, so this is pretty much uh, what I said earlier about the lifting um, of the air parcels. Um, why did it say something? Uh, oh, yes. The cold pool is one of the reasons why when you're somewhere and a thunderstorm is coming and you can see the thunderstorm, uh, as the thunderstorm approaches, suddenly you feel cold. Right? You feel cold before the storm approaches. Well, that's the cold pool of the storm that is propagating out and leading ahead before the thunderstorm. Speaking of convective triggering, I uh, just wanted to provide you with this, uh, with this visualization. Um, in this uh, plot here, in this GIF, uh, you can see a radar loop um, I believe this is in the area of Memphis, um, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, anyway, you see this convective system, uh, these convective systems at the boundary of this GIF, okay? And these generate the cold pools that you see. These cold pools are propagating at an angle, right? Uh, they're propagating at an angle, and at some point they collide very close to the black dot, okay? Notice that a few moments after their collision, okay, uh, you have convective cells that generate, that are generated in that particular area, okay. This is exactly uh, what I meant uh, when I said that they can help, um, they can have, they can help in convective triggering. I gave you the example of the wind that is pushing, 
against uh, coal pools. But if you look at the image in this slide, uh, you could also have two or more coal pools that are coming together and essentially they squeeze the air between them and the air between them doesn't have anywhere to go. There are these pressure gradients at the gust front. Um, the only place that the air can go is up and that will generate, uh, that will generate clouds. Now, uh, I want to conclude uh, with um, I want to conclude with um, with one mention of what happens over the ocean. So what you're seeing here is a um, slide that is a picture that represents the water vapor mixing ratio at the surface. Um, let's say this is a condition very similar to what happens in the West Pacific. Notice, you can see all the different cold pools. There's no synoptic variability. Notice that the areas around cold pools are really, really, really moist. So the air parcels around cold pools are actually a lot moister than the rest of the environment. This provides additional, this additional moisture provides additional moist static energy to these parcels. And the additional moisture energy decreases the convective inhibition that these parcels encounter. So cold pools over the ocean are not uh, typically as strong as the cold pools in uh, the mid-latitudes. And so maybe for them the pressure gradients are not as strong as the pressure gradients uh, that you could have in the mid-latitudes. And so this mechanism whereby you, know, you, push, you push and you squeeze things this is not as efficient. Luckily, however, over the ocean, cold pools pick up a lot of water vapor and they have these moisture anomalies. Sometimes they're called moisture rings or moist patches. And through another kind of forcing that is called thermodynamic forcing, the other one was called mechanical forcing, when you like squeeze things up, um, cold pools can still play an important role in, um, in, uh, in deep convection. Okay, I think this uh, concludes all I wanted to tell you about um, the basic ingredients of convection, really. Um, we will see in the next lecture, we will talk about what happens when convection organizes. So we'll talk about mesoscale convective systems, uh, which are very frequent in mid-latitudes and in the tropics, and they're very, very important. Um, I am madly in love with these topics. I hope you enjoyed today's lecture. Um, please let me know if you have any questions, anything was not clear. Um, if you'd like to discuss anything, you have my email address, you have my uh, phone number, My um, we can set up a Zoom uh, chat room, you have my Skype details. For anything, just please don't be shy. Feel free to reach out at any time. As usual, stay inside, don't go out. Let me know also if you need something for your life, like um, paper towels or toilet paper. Um, I'll be more than happy to, to bring you anything that, um, that you may need. Um, and yeah, so I'll see you next time for a lecture on mesoscale convective systems.